there are basically four things that I'm going to talk about today. Uh, so it all starts out with, uh, of course, Elon Musk. Uh, most of you know about you know, who Elon Musk is, but I'll do a brief intro. Uh, so we'll talk about four things. We'll talk about the Elon Musk, we'll talk about the Hyperloops, we'll talk about the SpaceX, what the competition is about, which is trying to make the Hyperloop a reality. And uh, we'll also got, talk about how you can get involved. So, um, so first of all, uh, this, this, this guy, first of all, who, who is Elon Musk? And Elon Musk is the CEO of SpaceX and Tesla. And he's the co-founder of Solar City. So uh, why I'm starting with this is Elon Musk's intentions are something that we need to understand before we actually go on to understanding what the Hyperloop is. So this is pretty, pretty radical person in general. He had a tough childhood in South Africa. He was a self-taught programmer. He aced college. He went on to found Zip2, which was an e-commerce, uh, e-advertising e website. Then what he did was he uh, sold Zip2, and then with the money he got, he got around $34 million after selling Zip2. He founded, uh, he went on to found PayPal with a couple of other people. And uh, he, it was actually called X.com, and it became PayPal, it was renamed PayPal. And then he ended up selling PayPal to eBay. And uh, with the money he got from that, he founded two more companies, SpaceX and Tesla, because what he wanted to do was make humanity a multi-planetary species. Because uh, while, while all his other uh, adversaries, all his rivals, and all his other people were trying to exploit the dot-com boom and uh, trying to exploit the internet, what this guy was trying to do was he was trying to get humanities to march. Humanity to Mars, and we all know. We all know. So this has been a very important. This has been a very important month for transportation and for Elon Musk in general because uh, uh, all of you know about the Tesla Model Three, which was released uh, like uh, the beginning of this month. There was also the SpaceX reusable rocket landing, which was a landmark in space exploration. Uh, it's also a very iconic month for India because uh, there is the Gatiman Express that was released. Um, now, the Gatiman Express is the fastest mode of ground transport in India. Uh, it's, it travels at around 160 kilometers per hour, and it's faster than the Shatabdi, and isn't it? Reduces it's it, it's around one it, it's around uh, 10 kilometers per hour faster than the Shatabdi, which which was the Shatab, which was which was the fastest train till then. So yeah, it's, it's, it's a very iconic time to be here. It's an exciting time to look into these concepts. So, so yeah, so uh, Elon Musk has beaten all, all, all odds throughout his career. He has proved his skeptic strong. So where does the Hyperloop fit in in his plan? So South Africa, Zip2, PayPal, Tesla, SpaceX. And then in 2013, which is three years ago, uh, what he did was he proposed something called the Hyperloop. Now what, what is the Hyperloop? Hyperloop can be briefly described as a cross between a Concorde, a rail gun, and an air hockey table. And I'll come, come to this explanation later, but this is, this, is, this is basically all you need to know to, to understand what the Hyperloop is. So uh, essentially what it is, it's, it's a ca capsule full of people in a low pressure tube, elevated on pylons, it goes really fast. And he proposed this from LA to SF. So Los Angeles and San Francisco are two very important cities, both commercially uh, and, uh, and population-wise in America. So he proposed this from LA to SF. And you have to realize how, how important transport is, because transport sort of forms the backbone of any, uh, of any industry, of any economy in particular. See, because because if you if you if you if you revolutionize transport, you rev, you make mar you bring markets closer to each other, you bring people closer to each other, and that basically revolutionizes your entire country. So that is why it's important to look into transport, uh, not only as a me means from going from point A to B, but as a means of uh, industrial development in general. So why why is the hyperloop needed? So what's what 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 um, prompted Elon Musk to come up with his idea was that there was the very very costly California high speed rail which was which was proposed at about that time, and what this guy said was that this is, this thing is 
expensive this thing is slower uh why not why not we have something better so he come came up with this thing called the hyperloop and what he did was he released a released a very very lay, layman reading popular science paper uh it's called the hyperloop alpha paper a 57 page document which released in 2013 and which proposed a system which is safer faster cheaper more convenient immune to weather sustainable and self powering because it's well solar resistance to earthquakes and not disruptive to those along the route so why is it faster because well it's it it's supposed to travel at 1200 km per hour uh it's cheaper it's more convenient uh and it's solar so so all these things are accounted in that hyperloop paper and these things the high speed rail just couldn't account for um now how how exactly does it work you know i i could go into the technicalities this is what this is what a hyperloop pod looks like so you have a inlet at the front you have a compressor fan you have a compressor motor you have places to sit you have a couple of batteries so this is this is very this is a very technical description description but uh, i'll i'll go back to the description that we had a while back which is it's a it's a mix between a concord and a rail gun and uh, air hockey table now uh, now i most of you must be familiar with now what a concord is so concord is was one of the most fastest uh, commercial aircrafts which was which which was basically it, it traveled at the speed of sound it was it was phased out a few years back but why 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 is why is so why why do i bring the concord into the picture because well the concord like just like the concord it can reach speeds of up to 1200 km per hour now for a brief so for to get a brief idea of how fast this is you can probably look at this graph uh this is a comparison between how how much time it will take to uh cover all these distances so from 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 distance of bombay to bangalore how many people from bangalore out here quick show of hands okay how many people from bombay okay cool so um so yeah so if you want to go from bombay to bangalore it takes you 14 hours by car but by hyperloop would probably reduce that by 45 minutes uh, to 45 minutes so uh you don't know how possible it is to have something like that from bombay to bangalore but uh, in in terms of rough mathematics this is how it will work uh now a rail gun what is a rail gun uh, I, i don't know how many of you have played uh, halo uh the rail gun is one of the most popular uh weapons in halo so uh basically how it works is there are two 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 rails and your your ammunition is sort of mounted on the rail and because of a a, a circulating current through the circuit which is so formed you have the lenses law involved which sort of pushes the ammunition out so that's how a rail gun works um why is it compared to a rail gun because there is something called linear electric motors which power uh which power the hyperloop so if any of you are familiar with how a motor works there is a stator and there is a rotor so a stator is the outside part the rotor is the inside part usually so in a linear electric motor a stator is not outside it is basically linearly located so your rotor moves linearly around uh, along the stator so uh so this is what solar powered linear electric motor is and so it's and it's solar powered and so it's well it's 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 powered by the sun that's that's, that's, that's the best thing you can get uh so these these provide acceleration so no fossil fuel why is it called a air hockey table uh, why why can it be compared to air hockey table because well uh, the capsule is suspended on a frictionless air cushion so uh basically what happens is uh, just like an air hockey table an air hockey table you have air coming out of pores in the table but out here you have air coming out of the pod itself and it sort of creates its own suspension air air bearing suspension so this is this is why this is this is these are the three components of what the hyperloop is now why why is the hyperloop unique now there are there have been multiple modes of transport proposed like this throughout throughout history but why this is unique is because this has something called the compressor fan at the to- at 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 at, uh, at and uh, at the snows uh why this is important is because when you are going at very very high speeds uh, the term is transonic 
So if you're going at very, very high speeds of 1200 kilometers per hour, uh, what tends to happen is because you're inside a closed tube and there is a pod which is traveling at very high speeds inside the closed tube, it sort of acts like an injection, uh, like an injection. So it sort of squeezes air in front of it. And because it squeezes air in front of it, there is some, so there's some sort of deceleration. So the squeezed air does not allow the pod to go as fast as it should. So what you need to do is you need to bypass the air through the pod. So that's what the compressor does. It basically takes all the air in front of the pod, which is getting squeezed, and it bypasses it, and it passes it on the back through an exhaust at the back. It also uses it to create an air cushion, so it keeps it levitating. Um, the outside, so this is what an airflow around a hyperloop will look like. So the outside is normal atmospheric pressure, and the inside tube is very, very low pressure. So the inside tube is around 100 pascals. And as a comparison, you know that 10 to the power 5 pascals is normal atmospheric pressure. So, uh, so yeah, so this is, it's a very, very low pressure environment inside the tube. Now, what, what is this competition? So, well, this was a, so what, what Elon Musk did was he proposed this Hyperloop idea in 2013, but there was not a lot of traction on it because there were not a lot of people who believed in it, like on the economic feasibility of it, the technological feasibility of it. There were two companies which were, which were rival companies uh, that were working on it, and very, very well-funded companies in Silicon Valley, uh, Hyperloop Transport Tech and Hyperloop Tech, uh, very, very similarly named companies also. But these are the only people in the world, world who were working on the Hyperloop. So, uh, so what SpaceX did was that last year they decided to open, like make, make it, make it open to universities all across the world. So they said, okay, um, um, this is, we are building a scale down, scale down model of the Hyperloop. And what you, what you guys can do is you can, uh, build, you can propose designs for building a scale down model of the Hyperloop in, in, in all these, in, in, for these particular conditions, for these scale down model, for the scale down model. Basically, what they're doing is they are building a one-mile straight track in Hawthorne, California, this August. By this August, that's what they say, but uh, I don't know, it might get delayed. So by this August, they are building it, um, and they have they have asked they have, so uh, so teams from all over the world had to uh, propose designs of the best uh, best pod that could fit those conditions. So uh, the, the bits team was one of the teams which which made it to this place. Uh, these are a few pictures from the from the competition. So as you can see, the competition is very detailed. So there are teams which have gone to as minute as detail as designing the structure out of styrofoam. So that that is that is that is a futuristic hyperloop station. So if you can see very carefully, there's. Uh, Different different ways to arrange the hyperloop station. You, 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 the red, the red, the red are basically the people and stuff like that. Um, that picture is that of a Hendo hoverboard. So, uh, so I don't know how many of you heard of this, but the hoverboard, the Hendo hoverboard, were kind of released last year. And what these guys are doing is they're sort of leasing out their technology to teams who want to incorporate this hoverboard technology to levitate that pod. So yeah, there was a hoverboard demonstration at the competition. So there was uh, there are also some teams which had uh, made scale down scale down demonstration of the technology. So this is a this is a inside view of a tube, and uh, there is uh, there is some there is some sort of platform which is levitating. So yeah, so uh, this is these these are, these are basically body designs, aerodynamics. Uh, this is a SpaceX stall. Uh, this this is the MIT Hyperloop team and their stall. And um, so so yeah, this is another small prototype. So uh, so what basically the, the intent of this competition is is to get some sort of international involvement and get people who are young and who are excited about new new disruptive technology uh, into the picture because. Most of the people in these companies, Hyperloop Tech, Hyperloop Travel, Incorporated, all these people are uh, uh, are not are not uh, are, are not are not university students. Basically, they don't have they don't have as much ac access to research facilities or to uh, to workshops or to faculty as 
as students have, uh, and, and they don't have the time, obviously. So, uh, so the Bits Goa team, uh, I, I don't know if Shubham is there, but uh, the Bits Goa team and the Bits Pilani team made it to the competition. And uh, we are a big shout out to our sponsors, CV Transport, who funded our uh, entire travel and stay. Uh, so, one of the biggest problems of this competition is that uh, it is very scaled down. So, uh, so basically, uh, as I mentioned, the track is just one mile long. Now, when you are doing an actual, when you're doing an actual hyperloop, when you're looking at an actual full scale hyperloop, uh, you're looking at distance of distances of up to 350 miles. And you and not only that, you're also looking at things like curves, curves in the track. You're looking at altitude changes in the track. And all these things come about just because of distance. So you have a lot of geographical limitations which sort of govern how big the track is, how looped it is, how 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 curving it is, how much it snakes, how much it uh, varies in altitude. So so what we did was we sort of looked at looked at all these limitations and you're sort of shocked by it because the problem is that the 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 specifications of the track they're very very concrete so no one can sort of improvise or do something do something which deviates from what this track specifies so if you have a one mile track you have to build for that one mile track now that one mile track doesn't have any curves so if your hyperloop pod has some functionality which takes care of these curves. For instance, when you're executing a curve, you need to bank your port so that the passengers inside are comfortable. Um, a lot of bullet trains have have this feature. But if you don't, if you if you're building just for a one mile track, then you don't you don't have to have a feature like this. And unsurprisingly, a lot of lot of teams did not. Uh, so travel distance is obviously very very less. So. Maximum speeds that one can reach are also very less because once you reduce the once you reduce the travel track time by to one mile, you reduce everything because uh, the maximum speed that uh, that was proposed in Hyperloop Alpha was around 760 miles per hour. But most of the teams there, which not because of any limitation of their own, but because of the limitation of the track. They can reach maximum speeds of only around 300 miles per hour, 200 miles per hour. And the problem with this is that once you don't reach the the speed domain of 760 miles per hour, you don't you don't encounter the problems that you encounter only in that transonic domain. For instance, one quick problem that I'll I'll tell you is if you don't if you don't go at 760 miles per hour, you won't get that buildup of air in front of the tube. And as a result of that, uh, you don't have to have a compressor. And once you don't have to have a compressor, you don't have to account for any of the problems which come up with, which come up when you include a compressor. For example, your pod sort of becomes nose heavy. So you do, your, all your mass calculations change, uh, your levitation calculations change, your payload requirements change, your structural optimization, your aerodynamics, everything changes. So the speed is sort of the god. Your, your speed determines everything almost everything about your hyperloop pod and because these these pods are mostly reaching maximum speeds of around 200 300 kilometers uh, 300 miles per hour that's why, that's why they are they, most of them don't have a compressor most of them don't have a lot of lot of things to encounter problems which are, occur at only those speeds uh, there are also a lot of other things like the diameter like because all the proportions are also scaled down now the test tube track diameter and everything is limited. It's everything is sort of squeezed down to suit the scale of the competition. Now this is not a wrong thing. This is this is completely justified because you have to start small and then go on to build bigger things. But the problem is that there is a huge gap between what the competition scale is and what the full scale is. So there's a huge gap which needs to be bridged. And uh, what our focus was to find as many of, as many gaps as possible, and try to scale them as comprehensively possible, as modular modularly as possible for any any hyperloop pod design. Now you can realize why this is important, because uh, the the competition should not just be a race to win, uh, win the comp like it should not just be about a race to win it, because ultimately what we're trying to do is build something which is which helps civilization. So you need to have something which can be scaled up. 
you know what what exactly is scalable design um, so this is this is an example this is so this is this is the mit teams design now this is an example of a design which is not scalable uh, you'd be surprised right? so uh, the mit team was the one which won which won the competition um, so they are, they, they are they are they are progressing now to build their uh, design but the thing is their design confirms very well a couple of very very brilliant graduate students their design confirms very well to the track specifications but as you can notice it, it doesn't have any space for passengers or cargo so this is not scalable design because once you once you blow it out to full operation scale it won't help you have to change everything you have to change the aerodynamics you have to change the structure you have to change everything to accommodate passengers and cargo in uh, so yeah so this is this is an example of design which is not scalable so what we were working on we were working on um, solutions for scalability uh, on the side the mit team actually had a pretty neat thing which in which they uh, they gave a boarding pass to anyone who came up to the hall so it was a pretty neat idea a nice marketing gimmick uh, so what are what are scaling solutions so a few of the scaling solutions that we sort of worked on was a we went we went to every single component we went subsystem wise we took something which is called a systems level systems level approach uh, so we went we we sort of uh, looked at the looked at the hyperloop we in terms of different subsystems so levitation propulsion braking safety etc and we targeted each of them and looked at how if you blow them out to full scale how they will change and and what what how you can tackle these changes so um, one of the things that we did was pod banking so as i said the the hyperloop pod sort of curves and snakes the the track so you need something which uh, which accommodates for these snakes and tracks. So, uh, so we came up with different solutions, and one was using halfback arrays. I won't go into the technicalities, but uh, it basically helps the, the the thing turn and tilt from uh, uh, while it's maneuvering curves, basically. Uh, we also looked at uh, supercritical airfoil design. So when you're traveling at very very high speeds, at 760 miles per hour. We decided to sort of fashion the fuselage in a way so that it it so that you get some amount of lift at very very high speeds, even at the low pressure that is there inside the hyperloop uh, hyperloop tube. Uh, we also looked at things like cabin design and passenger comfort because this is not this is not one of the things which was priority numero uno in the competition, but in 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 a full scale pod this will be because it it's it it'll it's it's one of Convincing passengers, convincing old people, convincing young people, convincing business business class men and women to board something like the Hyperloop and risk their lives, and uh, to convince them that it's basically not a roller coaster ride is also a huge effort. So you you have to have things like cabin design and passenger comfort, and to look at things like uh, how virtual reality experiences inside will be, how to trick the mind, how to make artificial stimuli, and all these things which come at very very high speeds. And very very high G's, uh, so yeah, so huge acceleration, huge velocity. So you have to take care of these things. Uh, we also looked at some forms of levitation. So we sort of hacked into some of the already proposed forms of levitation, and we came up with our own modifications. We also looked at very very minute things like maintenance schedules. So uh, when you when you actually make a full scale pod, uh, you can't just can't make it and just let it go. You have to also fashion out. Uh, a comprehensive uh, maintenance schedule weekly bi-weekly monthly annually and stuff like that so yeah a lot of these are some of the solutions we worked on these are um, so yeah so this basically gets you gives you an idea of the stuff that uh, that that you can work on and that we worked on so what are the future plans you know this is a very very ambitious project this is very very different from any technical project that you might have encountered uh, because a this is this is not it's not possible for any because because of the scale, it's not possible for any one university in India to build it on its own. Because uh, there are a lot of human resources involved, there are a lot of manufacturing resources involved, and there's a lot of time time which will which it will take to come to fruition. So, what are the future plans? So, um, we've we've got to it's a it's a broadly a four step plan. We've got through the first 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 of the plan so basically you make it to the spacex design weekend and present to teams 
and this is basically a, a process to get a foot in the door so now so now we are we are familiar with the process we know we know what other teams are doing we know we know what what where we lack so uh, what, what the international standards are then you collaborate with international build teams because our 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 scalability solutions they're sort of they apply uniformly to all teams because all of them I, I, we've gone and collaborated with them we've gone and talked to them and all of them are encountering so teams from MIT CMU Berkeley UWash uh, Georgia Tech etc all of them all of them have the same problem like some they the the scalability aspect of the problem has not been taken care of because the competition does not ask for it and uh, by by helping these teams sort of figure out their scalability what we are planning to do is essentially find out what works and what doesn't now the problem with uh, universities in india is we don't have funding so we don't have opportunities to fail a lot but these people have excellent workshops these people have excellent uh, faculty and they, these people have excellent resources and uh, they have they, they they have the money to make multiple test rigs experiment again and again and see what works see what doesn't so yeah so working with them is sort of an opportunity for us to realize what works and what doesn't a uh, simultaneous plan right next to it is expand to university in india which is happening right now uh, so yeah this is uh, so this this seminar happened in bits pilani a while back uh, now it's happening in goa and hyderabad so bits campuses there are no iits involved in the competition uh, and getting them in is also a very good idea because you get in government funding and you get in once the iits are involved you yeah, credibility sort of increases and you get corporate sponsors and stuff like that and other private universities obviously uh so yeah so you get access to human and manufacturing resources uh then you basically you create a sort of a pan india initiative you get corporate sponsors and industry experts involved because this is something which is a, take a, a a lot of uh adults also involved so yeah so it's a it's a it's a pretty elaborate plan to build a working hyperloop pod so this is this is one of the ways uh that we sort of contemplated and thought about how to how to go about these things so um who can get involved now this is a question that i'm asked uh because it 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 because when you look at the thing it sort of basically looks like a mechanical engineering challenge uh but the the good news is the the with the problem has vast as the hyperloop there is no there is no one field or one discipline that can help us uh a, a quick uh, i'll give you a quick idea of of exactly how multidisciplinary this challenge is so so if you are if you are uh, if you are from different fields you can sort of listen to me and sort of try to figure out uh and i'll try to sort of walk you through uh, this multidisciplinary problem so this this problem is a root optimization problem now uh what a root optimization problem is is given a point a and b can what what is the most optimum route a hyperloop can travel from point a and b uh this is not a trivial problem because once you have the optimum route you know what is you you can calculate and you know exactly what the economic feasibility of the hyperloop is and the economic feasibility of the hyperloop is a huge part of the whole process of convincing different patrons govern governments sponsors to come aboard the project so i'll sort of walk you through what this problem is is there any computer scientists in the room uh, you must be familiar with uh, discrete optimization problems as in if any co any competitive programming experience that you might have you might have um, so this is not a discrete optimization problem you so a discrete optimization problem would be something like uh, a grid given to you with some factors and you have to find uh, and given those factors you have to find a the uh, optimum path from one point of the grid to another point of the grid now uh why this is different is because this there's no grid there's no discrete structure it's a continuous it's a continuous domain so you have so when you are optimizing route from a to b you have problems like trees mountains oceans existing civic infrastructure uh, rivers uh and once you've dealt with all those problems you have other problems like if i'm like what how 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 curved should the track be at different points because uh, because if it's too curved and it's traveling at very high speeds then centrifugal force will basically make it some sort of bop ride people will vomit all over the place you don't want just astronauts to board the hyperloop 
brain last night. So, uh, so we wanted so so your root optimization to involve careful calculation of exactly how how curved it will be at different points. Now, how curved it will be at different points will determine what velocity it will have at different points. Uh, now, this will this in turn will determine what. Uh, so, so now it's like an economics problem. So now, once you have a a point A and B, you need to you, you need economics economics the uh, economics to figure out if it's possible if it's if it's more feasible than say having a having a plane between point A and B or having some some car system in between A and B because if there's a huge mountain range between point A and B, it doesn't make it make sense to have an isolate. You might as well fly a plane between point A and B. So now it's an economics problem. Um, how does it sort of go into other other fields okay so once you're determining the track you need to figure out what exactly is the footprint of the hyperloop so how much existing civic infrastructure is actually disturbing how do you determine that you sort of have to measure out what the base of the pylon is on which the tube is sort of uh, lifted the tube is elevated above the ground right so what the shape of that base is what what the height of that pylon is that is the civil engineering problem so so you need people from sort of all fields to come together and contribute expertise to something like this for something like this to be to to come to fruition so yeah this is a basic example of what a root optimization problem is uh, and how multidisciplinary is this now uh, why should you be involved now uh, there are many 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 big reasons i can i could drop uh, the first of all is it's large scale, high profile, futuristic technology. Uh, it's going to affect uh, big things, big, big people, big markets, big, big economies all over the world. And it's it's, it's a good idea. It's like, it, it feels nice to be part of a big thing. So um, so yeah, so it's a large scale, high profile, futuristic technology that promises to change the world. And by contributing to scaling problems, I think it's a very very direct way to affect it because. Because almost no one in the world is working on scalability issues. Uh, you get to interact and engage directly with SpaceX and Tesla engineers. Now, uh, I'm mentioning all these things because uh, all all our team members, uh, all uh, me and but me, uh, my team members, all we we all have gone through all these things. So hence we we, we know how how it's an opportunity for uh, for anyone getting involved to do this. So yeah, so you get to interact and engage directly with SpaceX and Tesla engineers. Now, uh, this is the this is the sort of this is sort of the only opportunity of this kind in India because SpaceX, a SpaceX is a space exploration thing, so it will never come to India to do anything. Tesla has very very cleverly skirted India for a long time. They wanted to build their Gigafactory lithium-ion factories uh, in Asia somewhere, and they and even though Modi visited Moscow a couple of times. Uh, they conveniently skirted India and decided to build their lithium ion factories and their car factories in China and Japan. So yeah, so it's, it's, it's not that there are not a lot of opportunities to get involved with these people, and these are very very brilliant people. As in, it's all over the news the sort of stuff they're doing with SpaceX and Tesla and stuff like that. Uh, be responsible for the Hyperloop being built in India. Uh, this is important because there is currently no other. Uh, body working on this uh, because they don't have any initiative. There are, there are a couple of other teams from India who qualified. The problem is that uh, th th there is no incentive for them to work. But we sort of working on scaling problems, which is sort of a long term problem. It, the, the problem will come about when the competition gets over. So the competition is in its in is is happening right now, and pods are building right now, and the scaling problem will will come come about when they actually build the pod. And they need to scale it up in the future. Uh, it's also an opportunity to work on a very, very multidisciplinary problem. So, getting involved with uh, economics, civil engineering, chemical engineering, heat transfer, material science, computer science, mechanical engineering, obviously, uh, electrical engineering, and uh, learning about a host of different fields in a very, very short time. So, uh, like there are huge, steep learning curves which are involved, which I personally find very exciting. Uh, obviously, collaborate and interact with students from top engineering universities around the world. Um, yeah, this is this is this is a very good good uh, opportunity, engineering-wise, to sort of see what these people are up to, 
and sort of realize that they are also sort of uh, human beings like all of us. <laughs> they, they don't have antennae and they don't spout smoke. So yeah, so um, you know, obviously this is the last one is my favorite. Uh, meet Elon Musk. So, uh, so this is this is so Elon Musk sort of did a cameo at the competition. He he wasn't supposed to be there, but he just turned up. And uh, I don't know if you can see the video. Uh, can you hear it? So yeah, so that was that was Elon Musk. He, he gave like a thirty minute speech, and he he addressed India also in the middle. He addressed Delhi and the audio and system and the pollution. And uh, so what what he's saying out here is it's clear that the so this is the transcript. It's clear that the public and the world want something new, and you guys are going to bring it to them. So congratulations. So uh, so he made a brief cameo, and he sort of uh, like everyone 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 just simultaneously blew their minds. So, um, so yeah, the mo most important part, uh, how you can get involved. Uh, uh, so, so we sort of thought about how how to get as many people involved as possible because it's a very long-term project and need need uh, not full-time commitment but at least part-time commitment. Now, what why part-time commitment is possible? By why working on this while working part-time is possible is because this this model has been replicated multiple times. So the two companies, one of the companies which are working on building Hyperloop, Hyperloop Travel Tech, they already have a system like this where people have full, they have have full time jobs in Google, Yahoo, and all these companies, Boeing, etc. But they sort of work part time on the Hyperloop. So the company, for, in exchange for stock options, so the company is actually it's actually run entirely by people working part time. And uh, why this is imp why this why why something like this exists because it's a it's a, it's a very futuristic and hu big level, big 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 technology. Now I'll, I'll give an example of why why something why transport why transport itself is important. So in America in uh, in the in the in the early 1900s in the late 1800s, this guy called Vanderbilt came up and he was the guy who was uh, responsible for setting up the steam engine network. And why the steam engine network was important is because. The steam engine network instantly made it easier for coal to be transported from point A to point B. And once you have coal being transferred fast from point A to point B, you have industries which work faster. You have manufacturing processes which are streamlined. You have everything. Everything which is happening is happening at a faster pace, just because you can get coal from point A to point B. And once the once the once once the steam net once the steam engine and the entire network of railways was set up. You had other industries which came up just to support that network, and uh, so, so so the coal the coal industry boomed, the the petroleum industry boomed, the steam engine industry boomed, and everything else obviously boomed because you get markets closer to each other, you 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 affect the economy as a whole, so it becomes easier to for me to transport steel from point A to B, so so that is why it's it's like it's, it's important to get involved in huge disruptive technology like this. Uh, how you can get involved now? What what basically you have to do is uh, submit something called a strawman proposal. Uh, now, what a strawman proposal is? It's it's, it's basically a, it's it's a starting point in the evolution of any project. So, um, it's a very simple draft proposal, which is not it's not meant to be a solution to a problem. It's more uh, it's more related to finding the problem and generating discussions of its advantages and disadvantages. <laughs> So a strawman pro so the, how how the evolution of a strawman proposal works is it's first a strawman proposal and then it becomes a woodman proposal and then then it becomes an iron man proposal so that that's how it works. Uh, so so uh, yeah so the strawman proposal should be grammatically of this form. So uh, and uh, for any of you who, are, uh, who want to note this down or anything, don't worry. The I've given I've given link out here. Uh, this link bit.ly slash bitcyclelook join. You just have to remember this link. Uh, every uh, everything I say from here on about processes to get involved has been mentioned uh, verbatim in this link. So uh, so don't worry about jotting this down or anything. It's just an explanation of what this concept is, uh, what this concept of strongman proposals is. 
you can find everything at this link bit.ly slash bits uh, hyphen hyphen loop hyphen join. So yeah, so it should be grammatically of this form. Uh, I want to use dash to dash. Now there are two blanks out here. Uh, so as I said, a strong proposal is a very, very simple boiled down statement. So it doesn't have to be in fancy language or fancy words. Uh, what what it should be is there should be some thought involved in what what blank one is and what blank two is. So blank one should be a skill set, uh, an area of knowledge or a field of interest or technique or method that you're very familiar with yourself and which you can describe in detail. Now, uh, and blank two should be a problem related to the hyperloop in any way. So uh, as I mentioned, uh, Elon Musk has a 57 page hyperloop paper. Uh, it's a good place to start. So you can look at the contents page there. Uh, it should be a, it should be a problem related to the hyperloop in any way. Uh, now this might this might sound a little vague, but I'll I'll give you an example to sort of understand what Stroman proposals look like. So um, so yeah, this is a this is a simple Stroman problem problem. I want to use my knowledge of vibrational modes to determine pylon dimensions for the hyperloop tube. Now you can realize why uh, by looking at this you can realize how how much of an blank open open ended canvas the Stroman proposal is. You can you can be a first year student who is who has only done his Miao courses and you can still be involved if you know your if you know your vibrational modes very well and you can sort of learn how, you can you can always be taught like everyone's learning from scratch here uh, it's, a, it's 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 a huge steep learning curve but everyone's learning from scratch here so yeah so you, you can say okay I want to use my knowledge of vibrational modes to determine pylon dimensions for the hyperloop tube now why vibrational modes are important because if you have a structure like this. The three-pronged thing. Uh, it when 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 an earthquake happens or when some sort of movement happens, it tends to vibrate, and you need to know exactly how how the thing is dimensioned out, how what is the, what are the structural requirements, so that it doesn't like vibrate in resonance and sort of break. So uh, this is a sort of um, mathematics civil engineering problem. So I want to use my knowledge of vibration modes. Uh, if you go one step down, or something even more simpler, I want to use my experience solving JE thermal expansion problems to figure out how temperature changes will affect the size of the defect or the gap in the hyperloop tube. I'm sure all of you have um, done that that uh, JE expansion problem, which is about a ring and there's a there's a gap in the ring, and it says, okay, I apply this much heat or I apply this much temperature difference to the ring, and you have to figure out, oh, if the gap increases or decreases. And there are very, very various uh, versions and variations to this problem. It turns out that is not just uh, MCQ problem. That is, that is that can be used, uh, extrapolated further, and can be used in something as big as the Hyperloop too. Um, so this this is a fun one. I want to use my experience playing video games to imagine virtual reality experience, so that will make people inside the Hyperloop comfortable. Uh, this is important because this is, this is, this is again come on, come under the cabin design and passenger comfort. Uh, domain. So uh, when you have people traveling at such high speeds, you don't want them to feel like they're traveling at those high speeds because it's, it's terrifying. So you you do something like you you uh, if any of you have come across uh, the Oculus Rift or stuff like that, you use use uh, visual stimuli to replace inertial stimuli. It's difficult, but it's possible to some extent. It has been done. So you. Basically, fashion the virtual reality experiences of someone inside the hyperloop. Uh, so, as you can see, uh, the blank one is something that someone is familiar with, and blank two is something related to the hyperloop. Uh, now, uh, you don't exactly have to say detail the entire solution because that's that's going to be a very very difficult problem. But you you just have to frame this statement. So it's it's everything is boiled down to framing this statement. Uh, now, as I said, it's multidisciplinary, so proposals don't always have to be engineering related. Uh, for instance, I want to use my knowledge of behavior and psychology to make the cabin of the Hyperloop comfortable to children and senior citizens. This is a very, very valid problem. Uh, how do I, how do I figure out, uh, how, how do I figure out how a senior citizen will react to huge speeds? Or how do I make it more comfortable for them? How do I, how do I fashion basically user experience? Uh, I want to, so you, you can also make it go as technical as you want. Uh, you can, so, so you can see how open-ended this is because you can, 
use as much jargon as you want and you can use as less jargon as you want and you can get across and you can make a very 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 valid argument so i want to use my experience of creating pug matrices to compare economic feasibility of the hyperloop with other modes of transport so this is slightly jargonized uh, a pug matrix is essentially a matrix which just lists out different options and you compare them it's this one one way to compare them just directly Econo economics people in the crowd would know probably you can also go ahead and make it very very complicated uh, so i want to use my coursework on adding angular momentum vectors to explain the gyroscopic effect of the rotating compressor turbine on the hyperloop pod uh, so what this is basically what the gyroscopic effect is is essentially when uh, the easiest way to explain it is using a top so when you when you are rotating a top uh, it tends to sort of stay and precess it, it sort of to stay in that dynamic form of rotation it doesn't tend to tilt until it sort of loses angular momentum and then it, so basically it tends to stay in that in in that plane of rotation and why this is relevant to the hyperloop is basically when you have, when you have a huge compressor turbine and when it's rotating you have huge fans that are rotating they tend to have sort of a gyroscopic effect which sort of affects the affects the orientation of the pod in general so the pod also tends to rotate on its on its axis on different axes so yeah so this this can be done by simply adding angular momentum vectors it's not that huge a problem so but you can you can work on this also uh now uh, we also before so how, how do you judge a strawman proposal so you can sort of look at what bad vague strawman proposals are so i want to use algorithms to design computation <laughs> systems board the hyperloop uh now this is this is this is a bad one because you are not specifying what algorithms you want to use you are also not specifying what computation systems you want to modify board the hyperloop uh second i want to use my experience with sensors to design telemetry system for the hyperloop this is so now the blank 2 is very specific but blank 1 is not specific because it doesn't tell me what sensor you're using what uh, if you're using uh, some sort of accelerometer or if you're using something else or some uh, whatever so uh, now now there is a 300 word description that you can that you can give for the strawman proposal so in which you can explain exactly why you have chosen blank 1 and blank 2 uh, the third one is obviously the worst i want to use a catapult to throw ice cubes into the sky to solve global warming uh now blank one well it's it's pretty impractical uh and blank two doesn't have to, anything to do with the hyperloop so yeah so these are examples of what very bad and very vague strong proposals could be uh you also obviously have a 300 word description which you can give uh which which can explain any anything that you find vague in the thing so yeah so the form is that this, this these are the these are the basically the two links that you need to know about uh you can find the guidelines at bit.ly slash which hyperloop join you can find this entire seminar a reader friendly version of this pdf like if you want to go through this these slides again you can find that there's a link for that also in 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 the bit hyperloop join link and the form is at bit hyperloop apply you can uh, you can also submit a google doc link containing a 300 word description so if you want to include stuff like um, images media or anything you can put it on a google doc and submit the google doc link make it make it make it public of course and then submit the google doc link and you can uh, uh, you should submit before 29th april uh, like it's, it's before the comp is it will help people out so yeah big big thank you to bits embryo uh, aparna nimesha uh, and uh, all the all uh, chaitanya all these people they they did this in they organized this in uh, like two days uh so big thank you to them uh and uh, of course these are the two links and thanks for coming any 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 questions or any answers or any anything any queries that anyone would want to ask i'll just take them now just any questions uh uh Where can I find the timeline of the uh, bits hyper sorry the hyperloop uh, competition? Uh, the hyperloop competition. So there is this yeah. thing. Yeah. There is this link called uh, hyperloop. tamu. edu. You can just you, uh, you can either go to that or you can just check out the Wikipedia link online. So if you just 
search SpaceX Hyperloop pod competition, the first Wikipedia link that you get will have everything about the competition. So, yeah. Anything else regarding the Hyperloop or anything else regarding Strawman proposals or uh, anything in general? Hello. Yeah, uh, so by partial requirement, uh, you mean three to four hours a week or is it more? Um, so it's, it's all up to you as in how much, how, how, however much time you can put in. Uh, it, there's no, there's no, there's no strong arming people into getting involved because it's, 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 it's purely a passion based thing because the, the rewards are uncertain and they are, but, but, uh, but the, 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 the sort of what you, what you get in the future is it's, 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 it's I think it's worth it. So. Uh, we're not exactly sure right now how much time you'll have to get involved. Involved, but during the during the vacations, if you have time, if you're on your PS or you have nothing to do, I think I think that that's a huge time to look at uh, uh, in terms of how how much time you can get involved. So yeah, so three three to four weeks, three to four hours a week. Yeah, sounds fine. I think if you if you can do that and or, and you can do something very productive in that small time. Is that, there's no problem with that. So this this model has been replicated in multiple multiple places. So there is this thing called Open Loop, which is uh, which is created out of uh, which which is sort of made out made from teams from Cornell, Princeton, Harvey Mudd, University of Michigan, and two other two other uh, universities. So this multi inter thing has been done before and it, it is successful. Um, uh, so yeah, so that, that, that's around it. About it. Is, is there any follow-up question or anything in particular? Anyone else? Where can we find many more details about the hyperloop, like the acceler acceleration, the deceleration distances, and all? Uh, acceleration, deceleration distances of what? Of the, the complete, so acquiring of complete the competition speed. of the competition or the, the hyperloop scale? of the full-scale model. So the full-scale model, they so I think what you're referring to is something uh, known as the velocity profile. Is that what you're referring to? So it's basically uh, what the velocity will be in with with relation to time. So all this you can find in the Hyperloop Alpha paper. Uh, it's 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 a very it's, it's it's not very technically written. It's it's, it's sort of like name and introduction to the Hyperloop. So you don't need to worry about so you don't need to worry about uh, uh, technical technicalities. There are also like a, few, a, a little a little search on the internet, and you'll get multiple resources. Multiple. There, there's been some studies by NASA done on uh, sizing models for the Hyperloop, and there are multiple people who are working who have been working on it even before the competition. So yeah. So uh, anything else? Goa campus, do you have any questions? Do you have any questions, Goa Campus? No. No, cool. So, um, so yeah, so thanks thanks a lot for coming. Uh, Hyderabad Campus, no questions more? No more questions? Any questions? Yeah. Oh, what, what kind of work do we actually do if we uh, become a part of this? I mean, uh, do we do design simulations or... So it depends How does on what, exactly sort of, what 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 part of it are you involved in? So, for instance, you could, if you are, if you know, have experience using MATLAB and Simulink, your your thing your your uh, work would majorly involve uh, si si simulating something like this on on the. Like getting multiple control systems, multiple systems together, seeing how how they bunch together, how they how power is transmitted from one place to another, how energy is transferred, how, how, how air is transferred from one place to another, simulating that on a simulating model and seeing how, how efficient that is. Um, so yeah, so if you're, if, the, if, you're, if you're experienced with that, then you do that. If you're experienced with uh, computational fluid dynamics, then your work would majorly involve structural optimization, uh, aerodynamic optimization for different, different, for different, different masses, different weights, different weight distributions. So yeah, so the work can be as detailed and as less detailed as you, as, you, as, as it depends entirely on you. And the thing is, because because the entire concept is in its infancy, and 
uh, a lot of people don't know exactly where this is going in terms of feasibility. There is a lot of scope for experimentation and uh, uh, sort of realizing what what are what things you can incorporate. Now, uh, in terms of actually building the Hyperloop, we are not at the stage right now we can, where you can actually manufacturing manufacture something of the scale. So what we can do right now is we can look at scaling problems and we can troubleshoot them and we can um, sort of decide uh, as to what sort of solutions we need need for different different scaling problems. So that is why that is why the Strawman proposal is very important because it sort of not only allows you to find a problem with the Hyperloop, it also tells us about uh, about problems that we definitely we might have missed. So yeah. So uh, it, 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 do you have any very specific uh, query regarding to any sort of work or uh, the sort the kind of the nature of work that you have to do? Any specific queries? Or if any queries? From, from a, or you're from a field which which you think uh, which you which you don't see. Uh, occurring here, and you want to know how this might be involved, how this how this could help out. Uh, what about the energy storage uh, uh, in the pod? What about the energy storage about? So, energy storage. Uh, so, so if you if you want to go and check later, uh, the sections of the Hyperloop paper are uh, I think four point one point three, and it's it's essentially lithium ion batteries. Uh, so. Energy storage is a huge component of uh, of the of the pod, but it's it's not explored in a lot of detail in the Hyperloop Alpha paper. There are just two paragraphs on it. So, is there any specific is there any specific you know we want to know about the energy storage? No, no. Uh, why can't you put the people to sleep? Wouldn't it be much cheaper? What? Why can't you put the people to sleep? Wouldn't it be much cheaper? Why can't we put people? To sleep, people. In why can't he's asking? Why can't we put people to sleep uh, while they're in the hyperloop? Wouldn't because it be much the, cheaper? The travel, the travel time is very less. It's Thirty minutes. Uh, as in, I think you're um, you're talking about how how it's done in a lot of space movies, uh, in which the people go into hibernation and uh, they don't. Uh, so uh, no, the, the problem with putting people to sleep is it's a very huge process. So I, you'll have to have some sort of anesthetic, and anesthetic fields take a lot of time to settle in and a lot of time to. Uh, as in, you can just you can just think it out and imagine businessmen who want to get to a meeting in 30 minutes and they don't want to go to sleep and then deal with the effects of drogginess and stuff like that. They don't want to be groggy and stuff. So yeah, so, yeah. Uh, excuse me. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, for the competition, like, uh, are we just going to consider the uh, problem statement of competition, or uh, are we going to like consider the scalability also? Uh, yeah. So our team, our team is currently entirely focusing on the scalability problem because currently we don't. So the, what the comp? So there's a difference between what the competition asks uh, and what what scalability problems we need. So the competition asks you to. Uh, it, there's, there's the specification as to what, how, how big the tube is, the specification as to how long the track is, the specification as to where you have to break, where you have to the specification as to what the track is. So the competition is very limited, so to say. Now, Elon Musk in his, in his, in his thing said, he said that there would be future iteration of this competition because this is a, this is a, this is a, this is a process which keeps on adding. So. Any any flaws which get sorted, which which get noticed during this iteration of the competition will get uh, fixed in the next iteration. So so uh, in 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 this in this in this process in this in this iteration of the competition we are just dealing with scalability issues. Uh, but in 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 future iterations uh, when we are a bigger team, I think we'll have the capabilities to actually think about building a pod, manufacturing a pod here in this, this country. So yeah so. Does that does that answer your question? Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Cool. Cool. Yeah, I agree. Uh, anything else? Yeah. Last question. Um, yeah. How do you apply the brakes? How do you stop the pod? Uh, so it's so uh, one of the one of the one of the solutions is eddy braking. 
so eddy breaking is one of the one of the better solutions because sort of regenerative breaking which means that any heat which is dissipated uh, is uh, any sort of waste is is contained within the system and can be used so so yeah using eddy currents to break is one one option but uh, but there are a lot of uh, a lot of also emergency braking systems so there are secondary braking systems primary braking systems and uh, if you're if you're familiar with that if you have, if you have some experience in baja or fs or stuff like that you can you can definitely come aboard so. um, any other questions no more questions okay cool so uh, so uh, these these two links and this this hopefully this seminar will be will i'll i'll ask people to send send it send it to everyone through root mail so by by maximum tomorrow so uh, if you missed out on anything or if you want to go through these things again uh, then you're welcome to go and don't don't hesitate to mail so the uh, ma email id is kl at bitshyperloop.org uh, if you have any questions or have any problems just just don't hesitate to mail thank you so much for coming Bye. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.